169 years ago, George Washington became the first president of the United States, just eight weeks after the new Constitution had become effective as an instrument of government. No man in all history has made a greater contribution to good government in his country. To commemorate these enduring contributions and to honor outstanding men for their continued efforts in our time, the American Good Government Society, a nonprofit educational organization in the nation's capital, established the George Washington Awards in 1953. These awards to be presented annually to two such outstanding men at the Society's George Washington Day Dinner. This year's award goes to two United States Senators, William F. Noland of California and Richard B. Russell of Georgia. Past recipients of the George Washington Awards have been in 1953, Senator Harry F. Byrd of Virginia and the late Senator Robert A. Taft. In 1954, former President Hoover and Alan Shivers, then governor of Texas. In 1955, General Robert E. Wood of Chicago and Representative Howard W. Smith of Virginia. In 1956, the late Senator Walter F. George and George M. Humphrey, then Secretary of the Treasury. In 1957, Senator Carl E. Munt of South Dakota and Representative William M. Colmer of Mississippi. In addition to sponsoring the annual George Washington Day dinners, the American Good Government Society is concerned with a wider and a better understanding of the fundamentals of American government. In recent years, it has been studying the question of improving the electoral college system of electing the president. In this year, 1958, the American Good Government Society has arranged for you to see and hear some of the highlights attendant to the awards given at the annual George Washington Day Dinner here in your nation's capital. The next voice you hear will be that of former Senator Edward R. Burke of Nebraska, the president of the American Good Government Society. Mr. Burke. The speaker of the evening will be introduced by the senior senator from South Dakota, the Honorable Carl Munt. Thank you, Mr. President. Our two honored senators, distinguished guests at the head table, ladies and gentlemen. It is indeed a happy privilege and a pleasant opportunity to introduce such a talented speaker to such a group of wonderful Americans, and in turn to introduce so many outstanding Americans to such a great crusader for freedom as I am about to present to you. I suspect, Felix, that you know these good folks about as well as I do, but I do want you to know, sir, that you are about to address a gathering of Americans who represents the type of thinking and the character of convictions that have made America great and that are going to keep America, America. These, <laughs> these men and women, in my opinion, represent a majority attitude in America. Unfortunately, we have not yet developed the political machinery or evolved the organizational genius to enable folks like this to cross party lines and work shoulder to shoulder effectively to support the causes and the candidates upon which we jointly agree. But neither problems in somatic nor partisan prejudices can permanently present, present a determined majority in America from finding a way in which their efforts can become effective. Let me reiterate tonight that the fact that constitutional conservatives in this country are in the vast majority, but are, and I am glad that you agree with me in that Gallup poll, but that the fact that constitutional conservatives in this country are in the great majority and are frequently defeated on major issues 
because we are disorganized and disunited by artificial party lines is also accurate, but it is not right. And I believe we are going to correct that thing which is wrong, and I'm happy to say that at this time in this town, steps are being taken to provide a political catalyst which will enable those who think alike to act alike on public issues. These annual banquets, Mr. Speaker and I have attended them all, bring together some of the great Americans from all over the country who come here to meet each other, to think alike, and to be refreshed in the fact that there is a greater loyalty in this country than that to a party line, and that is to a patriotic conviction and to a great cause like human freedom. Senator Munt concluded his remarks by introducing Mr. Felix Morley. Senator Munt, guests of honor, and members and friends of the American Good Government Society, these two men who have been chosen on bipartisan lines to receive the highest tribute that I think uh, an American can offer to another, and a tribute in the name of George Washington. You will see that all of them, different though they are, one from another, all of them have that serenity, that inner serenity of character, that sense of integrity, that faith in the fundamentals of this country which characterized George Washington. I think that it is a, a, a splendid thing that this society, and I appreciate the opportunity that has been given me to be here with you tonight, has so successfully, for six years, maintained, I'm sure not quite unconsciously, but maintained the essence of the man after uh, whom, whom we honor at this dinner this evening. Mr. Morley concluded his remarks with an apt quotation from the last letter written by George Washington to James Madison. And now back to Senator Burke. Thank you, uh, Felix Morley. <clears throat> it happens that tonight <coughs> this society honors two members of the United States Senate for outstanding contributions to American good government. It, it happened uh, once before uh, that the award was made to two members of the United States Senate. Six years ago, the Honorable Harry Byrd and Robert Taft were the honorees. And it is a great pr privilege tonight that we have two of their colleagues or successors, or however the case may be, to receive these awards. Uh, the first uh, award uh, will be made, or the poll will be read and presented by the Honorable Stiles Bridges. Chairman, distinguished guests, my colleagues of the Senate and the House, ladies and gentlemen, there are two occasions when we may very appropriately pay tribute to those who unselfishly serve humanity and the public interest. One is when we honor the dead after history has placed its judgment on such a person. Here the nation gains strength from the past to meet the trials of the future. But more important to me is when we honor the living, to give them inspiration and courage to carry on the never-ending struggle for human dignity, human rights, and liberty. Now, there was never a time in our nation's history when we needed leadership as we lead it today. When I talk about leadership, I'm not talking about partisan leadership, whether they be Republicans or Democrats. I mean leadership who's willing to stand up and be counted. Positive leadership. Men and women in this nation who stand for a definite principle. Now, we need the leadership in this nation at this time of that type, that positive leadership. 
And tonight, we are honoring two of those men. And I'm very proud that both of them are friends of mine and are colleague, colleagues of mine in the Senate. It is my privilege tonight to pay a special tribute to my colleague and my leader, William Nolan. And I just want to say before I pay that tribute that I'm very happy that his father, Joseph Nolan, is here tonight to see him receive that reward. How proud he must be. William F. Nolan, statesman, soldier, patriot, political leader. He has served the people of California and the United States for a quarter of a century, in both houses of the state legislature, in the Army of the United States, and in the United States Senate, earning there in eight years the high office of majority leader. His understanding of our system of government a limited constitution dividing sovereign powers in a federal union according to the proper objects of government illuminates his public service. This understanding has contributed much to legislation as evidenced by the correction of the judicial error in the Tidelands cases. Candor, courage, integrity, and ability have marked Senator Nolan's career of devotion to the national independence and personal liberty, a sum total of human rights. This devotion to liberty re rejects the idea that any special group or interest may prescribe or limit the rights of free men in a free society. Senator Nolan, on behalf of this organization, it's a great pleasure to present to you this class and story. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, my good friend and colleague in the Senate and one who is also receiving an award this evening, Dick Russell, Senator Bridges, members of the House and fellow Americans. First of all, I wish to express my very deep appreciation to this organization and to Senator Bridges for the presentation which has been made. It's been a great privilege to serve in the Senate of the United States now for almost 13 years. And as I leave the Senate this year, I shall take back with me some wonderful recollections of the men with whom I have served, Democrats and Republicans alike, who have devoted themselves to the preservation of our constitutional system. I leave Washington this year with some very firm convictions. One is that our American constitutional system is the greatest system that has yet been devised by man for the preservation of a free people. Both as an individual citizen of this nation and as a senator of the United States, I do have a deep and an abiding conviction that if only we of this generation will use the same courage, yes, and the same common sense that motivated the men who sat at Philadelphia and under what I believe was divine inspiration, gave us first our Declaration of Independence and later our Constitution of the United States, 
They are none of our great domestic problems, as great as they may be, that we as a free people cannot solve. And there is no foreign foe we need ever fear. As I look back over the years, it does not seem to me uh, a very great lapse of time since I happened to serve in the United States Senate, but on checking the matter over tonight, I find there are only five members in the present Senate who were serving when I was sworn in. It is my uh, great uh, satisfaction that tonight we are to honor one of those five members who then and ever since has been my very great personal friend. And I have been especially gratified that we were able to persuade a man who, a fellow Georgian, who was interested in military affairs, served uh, as co national commander of the American Legion uh, to make the next presentation of the award, Earl Cox. Mr. Chairman, distinguished members of the Congress of the United States and the two outstanding senators that we are honoring here tonight. Mr. Cox made reference to a few of the many well-earned tributes to Senator Russell and concluded his remarks by reading the citation. Richard Bavard Russell, lawyer, statesman, patriot, superb parliamentarian, has devoted almost two score years to the service of his fellow citizens of Georgia and of the United States. Ten years in the Georgia House of Representatives, the last four as Speaker, one term as Governor, and a quarter of a century in the Senate of the United States. From his talents of industry and intelligence, he has gained a knowledge of the Senate. That institution of government under the Constitution, which the United States are continually and equally represented as co-equal political society, which, with his courage, makes him a tower of strength in that citadel of law and order and liberty. Senator Russell, Georgia's distinguished son, instinct with the great American heritage of Anglo-Saxon law on which the Constitution rests, repudiates as mere pretension that constitutional changes proclaim without explicit and authentic acts of the people of the United States. His watchword is liberty in the permanent union of permanent states. President Burke, Senator Nolan, members of the American Good Government Society, my colleagues of the Congress, fellow Americans. I think it would be safe to assume that most of us here tonight are political fundamentalists. The religious fundamentalists, of course, emphasize the exact words of holy writ. Political fundamentalists are those that believe in supporting the Constitution of the United States without deviation, without torching it, and without undertaking discretion. It was apparent that Senator Herman E. Talmadge of Georgia agreed wholeheartedly with his senior senator. In spite of that, we hear the voice of those who say that the Constitution is outmoded. And others uh, who are more subtle, they take the position that the Constitution is a sort of a political accordion that is to be expanded and contracted 
in accordance with the mood of those who hold temporary power in government. Of course, any system of constitutional government to be effective has restraints on governmental action. And the sum total of our liberties depends upon the recognition of the basic doctrines which find their origin in that national charter. Two of the most important of these are the doctrine of federalism and the doctrine of separation of powers. The doctrine of federalism includes many elements. The one that I refer to in this brief comment tonight is the division of sovereign power between the national government and the several states. For many years, this division was controlled by the simple rule that the national government is one of delegated power for enumerated purposes, while all of the residual or undelegated powers remain in the states or in the people. And to my mind, a primary test of good government involves an awareness of the importance of maintaining the balance between national and state legislative powers intended by the framers of the Constitution. For me, I am a disciple of the Jeffersonian school. The more that I study government, the more confirmed I become in the faith that the best and the most economical government is that which is locally conceived and locally administered. The other constitutional doctrine that has become distorted is the doctrine of separation of power. Founding fathers uh, not only divided sovereignty between the federal government and the states, but they were determined to prevent, to prevent the corrupting and tyrannous effect of undue concentration of power in the federal government. They were, in other words, afraid of one big government. They were familiar with that axiom that had been proven by history and informed the electorate can choose representatives to the National Con Congress that understand and respect the Constitution of the United States. <laughs> Even more serious than legislative uh, deviations have been the recent encroachments on the rights of the states and on the prerogatives of the legislative branch of the government by the federal judiciary. Some recent decisions of our highest court have contributed more to demeaning the rights of the states and to centralizing the power of the federal government than any legislation passed for the National Congress. In fact, a series of these decisions have all but wiped out a number of rights and privileges that the states have exercised since the birth of this republic. Under the cloak of judicial interpretation, the judiciary is constantly assuming powers that belong to the legislative branch. And the personal predilections of those enjoying life tenure on the federal branch have taken supremacy over precedent. Noted time and again, in the decisions of learned and able judges. The tendency of the Supreme Court to rely on psychology rather than legal precedent and to legislate rather than interpret is a proper matter of national concern. Judge Learned Hand has long been recognized as one of the ablest of our judges. Matter of fact, Judge Hand has had more judicial experience and all of the present nine members of the court combined at the time they were appointed to the bench. Judge Hand, in a series of lectures for one of our great colleges recently, uh, referred to the trend of the Supreme Court to make itself a third legislative chamber. We know that if the founding fathers had ever believed that the court would undertake to so invade legislative power, they would certainly have required the members of that body to go before the voters for periodic review, just as they required the legislative branch to do. This continuing practice of unrestrained judicial review 
It not only establishes the, the supremacy of the judiciary over the other two divisions of government, if it is unchecked, it will lead to judicial tyranny. Now, the Ninth and Tenth Amendments to the Constitution, designed to limit the powers of the federal government and protect the rights of the state and of the people, were once the keystone of our system. The series of decisions to which I refer it caused one to believe that the present court thought that they had been dropped from the Constitution. This whittling process had gone so far, my fellow Americans, that it threatens to reduce the several states to mere geographical boundaries. I wish to say to the members of this society that great organizations such as this in this country can serve as anchors to windward in these trying times. Pressure groups constantly seeking to strike down precedent, to do away with traditional concepts. We have loud clamor for change for the mere sake of change in many instances. Such organizations as this, if they remain dedicated to a maintaining a government of law rather than one of men, can be rocks which the American people can take refuge in a time of storm. I say to you, Mr. President, and to the members of this organization, that I shall long remember and be forever grateful that my efforts have merited your approval. Let us all hope and pray that the contributions of these great men of the past and of the future will continue to keep before us the tenets of liberty, justice, and freedom. Let us all forever keep this a symbol of the land of the free and the home of the brave, a shining shield of liberty, for this is the heartbeat of a great nation, a great people striving upward in God's image for justice and freedom for all. Senator Russell, face the nation. Through the eyes of this live television camera in Washington, D.C., you're about to see Senator Richard B. Russell, chairman of the Armed Services Committee of the United States Senate, face the nation with questions from veteran correspondents representing the American press here in the national capital. And now today's moderator of Face the Nation, Pinch hitting for Mr. Ted Koop is the Associate Director of CBS Public Affairs, Stuart Nobin. Senator Russell, we're particularly delighted that you're here to face the nation for one of your infrequent broadcasting appearances. You occupy a unique position in the Senate. You work as Chairman of the Armed Services Committee, as a member of the Appropriations Committee, and of the Joint Atomic Energy Committee, put you in a very important position of influence in the Senate. And also, your work, I think, deals with a great many of the questions that the American people are asking. How good is our defense? Are we maintaining a leading position of strength in comparison with the Russians? What about the defense appropriations and manpower? Your opinions are very highly respected, sir, and we'd like to hear them on these matters and on other matters of vital importance to all of us. To ask you about them, here is our panel of newsmen. William S. White, Washington correspondent for the New York Times, Edwin Hackinson, Washington Bureau of the Associated Press, and Clark Molinoff, Washington correspondent for the Des Moines Register and Tribune. And now with the first question, here is Mr. White. Senator Russell, I think it's probably generally agreed now that one of the biggest things left in Congress is the issue on which you've been so active. And that's the matter of creating a, an adequate military reserve. I'd like my first question to be very general to ask you this, whether you think in view of the circumstances now, the fact that the House has brought out one bill, you brought out another bill, in the Senate committee, whether there is a good chance that we will actually get a truly adequate bill in this Congress. 
Well, Mr. White, uh, I do not doubt that we will get a, a bill that will give us a better reserve than we have at the present time. Out of the conferences, it will be held next week between the representatives of the Senate and representatives of the House of Rep uh, will come an effective reserve bill. As to whether it will be adequate or not, I cannot say. I personally doubt that we will ever have a truly adequate reserve that would be strong enough to justify any reduction in our regular establishment until we have some form of universality in the training and service of our young men. Senator, of course, as you know, the, the reductions that you mentioned have, in fact, already been made in the Army and in the Marine Corps both, and granting that this is the state of fact now, that they have been made, uh, I'd like to ask particularly about one feature of the bill that you have brought out in the Senate, which, as I understand it, uh, really has the effect uh, of postponing compulsory military uh, reserve service for about two years. Is that correct? Well, it defers the compulsion of uh, reserve service for a period of two years. Uh, I don't uh, think that it uh, postpones it because there is no duty at the present time. Uh, we have uh, millions of young uh, men, two and a half to three million of them, who have gone into our armed services voluntarily, who had uh, worked out their future careers based on what they were going to do when they had finished serving uh, either two years in the Army or three years in the Marine Corps or four years in the Navy and in the Air Force. And I thought it was very unjust to those young men, some of them would be discharged within the next two or three months, to say, no, you're not through. You've saved four years, but you still have an additional obligation to remain in the ready reserve, attend 48 drill periods a year, and go off for two weeks of active duty. Mm -hmm. I thought that was particularly unfair because uh, we are now reaching a period where we will have hundreds of thousands of young men who will not have served any in our armed services, who will not be called on either through selective service or otherwise by any compulsion to serve. And it's not fair to let one man, when you get one man to apply the compulsion to him time and again, when another American who has the same stake in our country as the young man in the service that he has, uh, let the, him, him escape altogether. Yes, Senator, sir. if that compulsion is held off for two years, aren't you relying a great deal on the volunteer aspect of the reserve program? And what is there in this one that's considerably different from the old reserve program? Well, there are two or three things that will make the reserve uh, more attractive. Uh, under the uh, present reserve uh, program, uh, the reservists might uh, be liable for indemnity.